first of all, I would greatly appreciate the work which you have been doing here. And I would say it was for me a pleasure and very easy task to work together with all of you. You like uh, you are like uh, very well trained dogs, <laughs> 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 which which start the work from the very beginning. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that you mastered the cell methodology. You mastered the gear particularly the GPS's. Uh, sorry that sometimes we have to struggle to see in what cell we are. <laughs> but nevertheless, it worked in almost perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mm, it's really a great job. You know, uh, everything looks simple and we have tried to make our work our monitoring program as simple as possible and uh, you see that sometimes and I told you in the very beginning science could be and is when it's routine very boring uh, when we find a scat or we find a track and so on of course it would be look, looking more maybe scientific if, if we would be x-raying it a feces or analyzing it on micro elements and so that would be looking maybe more scientific but uh, what we are gathering here this is a true ground survey because all the stuff which builds upon that geographic information systems using satellite images modeling exercises and so on everything depends on the ground survey area which has been walked sorry sometimes tough steep wet bad weather but we have been lucky the weather has been mainly excellent so altogether we have done a great job I know politicians love, love, love that word great job <laughs> can I do this <laughs> So, um, and for the first time, perhaps, we have also taken into account zero cells. So, uh, and thanks to Amadeus, which is tracing the proper cells, <laughs> and uh, we have a large database from the very, very beginning. Mm. So, maybe I will make some minor mistakes, but altogether we have covered 51 cells and that's quite a lot if you multiply that by four square kilometers <laughs> it's quite a lot uh, and in 34 cells we have uh, records of snow leopard prey recorded once or more times so that's about two-thirds of the area which we have we have covered and uh, in three uh, other, as it's uh, uh, noticed here, other, that's wolf, three times, where we considered it was a uh, wolf sign. Mm, that's not much. Perhaps the wolves move in together with the herders. <laughs> so at this time of the year, uh, mm. it's uh, quite, a, quite rare records. Uh, we, uh, I've heard the impression that marmots are everywhere, for instance. But nevertheless, only half of the cells had marmot records, 26. So, uh, it's not so obvious. It seems that marmots are everywhere, but nevertheless, uh, that's uh, 26 cells out of 51 survey, uh, telling that it's not to, not, not, mm, well, environment isn't mm, homogeneous it's different in different places so this also will give some data about uh, why this happens why some cells have marmots others don't have of course you know you can't expect them at 4,000 meters <laughs> above sea level yes but nevertheless uh, what we are doing we are building the b database which 
uh, needs analysis and this is the first perhaps block of data which will contribute to our report and conclusions. Uh, in nine cells we have uh, come across Ibex and uh, five observations, direct observations, uh, eight uh, instances of uh, tracks, nine scat, one skull and horn. Well, I think one of them is a, is a victim <coughs> of last year's last year's last year's uh, Adnan I think you found that horn <laughs> all that, that's left of that animal uh, it could be you see uh, just I want to compare, compare two years ago uh, the first group had four direct sightings of Ibex and uh, very very uh, and uh, the red columns are numbers of interviews uh, taken as a proxy of uh, human presence. So you see when there were there's lots of human presence no Ibex sightings at all. So slot 3 went away not even coming across that Ibex. Yeah, so in some sense you're fairly lucky. <laughs> So this also will add to the data sheet, to, to the database, and uh, as you have seen that uh, in some places where we were expecting Ibex to be present, uh, as shown by the modeling exercise colored in red, <coughs> we didn't find anything. So this will also try, this will also be uh, helping to remodel uh, mm, well, um, refine the model and uh, find places where definitely ibex can be present, where there's good habitat suitability, and consequence uh, and, and and as a consequence, uh, snow leopard can be uh, found uh, records as well, and places where to s properly set the the camera traps. Uh, <clears throat> we have a few records of. Snowcock. That's especially when we went high up. So in seven cells, it's around 14% of the cells where we have been. Uh, there have been, uh, well, indirect sign of uh, snow leopard. Uh, first of all, the, while setting the camera trap in cell T17 um, an old sample of feces was found uh, and um, last year uh, Aman recorded in that exact cell snow leopard tracks so it seems that that's uh, one of the promising places for snow leopard and that's where three camera traps have been set and um, in a F20, Adnan found some, well, doubtful tracks, <laughs> difficult to say. Yeah, but nevertheless, it goes like a doubtful record, which may be, maybe not. But nevertheless, it's recorded. Um, I'm also very grateful for the team that uh, we uh, had the courage to split into overnights. So you see that the area was quite large, covered mm. by the overnight team. Um, well, it's quite difficult, you know, two days in a row, hard walking. Uh, I myself was exhausted. <laughs> and, uh, mm, but uh, nevertheless, this allows us to uh, cover areas which are further away from our base camp um, and uh, collect information in another place. Mm, well, hopefully, I don't know, it's your opinion, was it fun or not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So, uh, th this is shortly on 
uh, what we have achieved and it's quite a lot it's quite a lot for a, and a very good start and once again uh, it was very easy I hardly had to remind anybody take the data sheet made a record <laughs> and so on and uh, uh, all the data sheets I've gone through them they are neat uh, informative uh, only one data sheet didn't have a date I think Matisse it was you <laughs> <laughs> mea culpa <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it was Did you work it out? Yeah, I worked okay. it out. It was possible to uh, <laughs> to uh, figure out. So uh, that's what considers our mm, direct snow leopard and snow leopard habitat uh, research. Mm. Once again, don't be uh, disappointed that often uh, we don't find animals when we are expecting them or we go on a survey route and don't find anything. Anything, well, of course we find something, but say ibex, snow leopard and so on. Because zeros also matter. So the capture history also takes into account zeros. And they can be many, 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 many zeros. And one, that means presence or record. And uh, mathematicians have worked out uh, mm, methods which cope with those many zeros so it's not lost the information is not lost empty cells will also account so that will be that also will be an important uh, part of the database even the finding nothing uh, our bird survey a little bit confused because we have data sheets, we have apps, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we have found altogether, taking into account today's uh, observation of black stork, 29, 29 uh, bird species. Well, if you take into account last year's bird list, that's half of it. Well, it's quite natural, you know, the first team gets first served. <laughs> so you see a crow, <laughs> it's already included, and it's uh, your achievement. Uh, so 29 bird species, quite good. Three of them, uh, golden eagle, lamagaya, and today's black stork, are in the red data book of Kyrgyzstan. And uh, four species, uh, are considered uh, by mm, Kyrgyz uh, ecologists Davlet Bekov, Shukurov, yes, yeah. They uh, consider four species as indicators of um, alpine habitat and uh, good indicators of quality uh, of habitat. So these are these are the Alta accenters actually accenters, the two of them. But we've seen the Altaic Center, uh, Brands Mountain Finch. I think s some people have seen that. Mm. Yes, Brands Mountain Finch, Gültenstadt's uh, Red Star, <laughs> in English, White Winged. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mm, Hilmelain Snowcock, of course. Mm. Yes. So uh, don't be disappointed that mainly uh, droppings. Yes, but uh, if the dropping is there, so the animal has been there. <laughs> so it wouldn't appear otherwise. And uh, Adnan, I think, has also uh, heard one. Well, somebody also had heard one, yes? Okay, yeah. But uh, uh, also, it's not just a... Well, we, are, we, we take account of Himalayan snowcock as a mm, potential... Uh, secondary prey species of the snow leopard, uh, but uh, it's also an indicator of good quality alpine <coughs> habitat. Uh, so, interviews. This group was quite enthusiastic, especially when they get tired. <laughs> they go for interviews. <laughs> No, but interviews are a good experience. 
it's uh, really getting into the local culture, habits, just seeing people. So uh, we have uh, five interviews, I think, yeah, five interviews. Uh, thoroughly done, thank you, very good. Uh, these interviews actually uh, support our conclusions made in the previous year and uh, giving evidence of a snow, le snow leopard presence in the area and uh, quite often pointing that way, that way, to that range. And indeed, that's where we have found the best most most mm, definite sign of snow leopard tracks, snow leopard kill, scrape. So it coincides with what people are thinking here and uh, giving uh, their advice to us. Uh, snow leopards like them? Yes, they like them. <laughs> so this this also uh, appreciate the legal protection. Snow leopards don't attack livestock because both are separated. That's their opinion and perhaps 99% true. Uh, no human attacks. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't ask them about the blood, su <laughs> blood sucking. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that fairy tale, though. You did. No, you did? Yes, you did. Well, yes, it happens. <laughs> so, uh, snow leopards don't reduce ibex numbers, the relations are balanced. Well, good thoughts. Mm -hmm. Do they eat marmots or snowcocks? Different opinions. So, I have some uh, a video of a, of a snow leopard dragging back to its den uh, a marmot. I think I should show this to the local mm. people. <laughs> Yes, uh, and uh, in, as in previous years, of course, their main concern are wolves, and now also concern are wolves because there can be retaliations against wolves. People can come in with guns, make a lot of noise, and this, of course, will scare off ibex, snow, snow leopard, other wildlife. So this is also our concern. Uh, Snow leopards and tourism. Uh, I think we should go maybe. I'm just analyzing what you have produced during your interviews. So it's not only the snow leopard itself. Quite often, especially in the very beginning, uh, locals were convinced that we are here just to actually see a snow leopard. And they would come and say, We'll show you a snow leopard. Well, this is not our goal. We are not coming to a zoo. We are not coming to a national park. We are coming to study the snow leopard itself and the habitat. The habitat includes the prey species, primary, secondary, and other elements which characterize the quality of the habitat. This is our goal. So, I think that this needs some kind of explanation because there are, I think there are other options for the local people that could be exploited. For instance, botanical values. I think there would be lots of people from other countries which would be interested in that. Bird watching. Petroglyphs, once again. Even the locals don't know anything about that. It's amazing. It's amazing. But these are all values which are adding, adding, adding to the general uh, quality of the of the area. Local food. We've we've, we've gone through that. <laughs> <laughs> and hospitality. Horse riding. Etc. Uh, so I think this this all could be, I don't know, maybe embedded into the questionnaire to explore uh, knowledge, local knowledge, and what we can share with them. I think these options would be, would be fine. To set up small businesses. You don't have to have 20, 40 people 
in a group. It could be five if I pay for it. <laughs> and once again, the attitude towards protecting the area. And one of your herders, which you uh, interviewed, said that I would move to another place. But I wouldn't move people out. Just keep the traditional land use, make the people in charge of the area. They themselves could be uh, rangers responsible for kicking out uh, people like poachers, th thieves, others which are uh, mm, violating local rules. So I think all this also could be integrated. Thank you for your effort in the uh, mm, interviews. Uh, I think we will think about that and build upon that and I think we will be getting deeper into the local community, into the problems which they have and what we can do to help them resolve uh, and uh, make their life easier. Thank you very much. Great job. Great pleasure to work with you. I really, really wear this shirt. Only when, <laughs> <laughs> only when I really have a good group. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. A question: Bird sightings. Uh, the first year that I came as a, as a placement, uh, I had an application on my phone that was basically not working at all, and so we mostly just did paper recordings. And then the second year, uh, a couple people were able to use the application. It was still very much like under development. And then this year, finally, it was as close as we could get to making it a real version without calling it a real version. Uh, so thank you for being the beta testers. <laughs> and guinea pigs. For, yeah, the guinea pigs, that's I guess what it really is. Uh, and for, for um, going through and finding problems with the applications, but also just using it anyways and getting data that we can use out of it. Um, in the past two years, we've been able to find 20 species of butterflies both years. Uh, different uh, groups of, of species, but both years 20. Uh, just in this first group, we've already found 20. <laughs> so I can quickly read them off for you. Uh, there's not all of them have common names, I'm sorry, and I'm going to mispronounce these, I'm sure. Um, so there's four from the family Satyridae, and that's uh, Koinonympha sunbeca, Koinonympha seca, uh, Arabia Mopsos and Arabia Sokolovi. Um, Sokolovi last year was really, really common. Mopsos was not common. Two years ago, it was completely the opposite, where Mopsos was almost entirely the only one that you found, and I don't think we actually, we may not have even found Sokolovi two years ago. And this year, it's the same. Mopsos is everywhere. Like, everybody's like, oh, I saw that brown one with the spots again. Yes, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only seen Sokolovi twice, so. Um, yeah, have maybe maybe they have a, a a switch per year. Have you noticed anything with the climate? It's been a lot warmer this early in the year. Last year uh, it was pretty rainy, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this year it's very really warm. Yeah. Uh, in the family Pieridae, we have Coleus irate, Pieris nappi, Pieris rape, and Pontia calidice. Um, four that we we found last year, so it's good. Um, Papiliana Day is interesting. Last year, we only found Parnassius delphius and Parnassius tianchanicus. This year, we found lots of Papilio macaon, the swallowtail, the black and yellow one that is always having a drink on the road. <laughs> driving, yeah? um, lots of them this year, none last year. Uh, Parnassius delphius, we found a couple this year. And then one which we didn't find last year, but we did find two years ago, was Parnassius uh, nemocene. So the clouded Apollo. And then um, Nymphalidae, so the orange and black ones that you're like, oh man, what in the world is this one? They all have orange and black and spots and stripes. Uh, so you have Aglaeus urticae, which is the small tortoise shell. Arginus aglaea, the dark green fritillary. Isoria lethonia, the queen of Spain fritillary. Melitea solona. And then three that I'm 
I just have to go back and look at pictures, but I've added them in anyways. Uh, Melatea Ala, Colossiana Erubescens, and Beloria Generator. Um, Beloria was very common last year. Two years ago, we only had one sighting. So hopefully we'll get a lot this year. And then in uh, Lacana Day, we had Cupido Buddhista, the, the uh, Buddhist blue. A little, little blue one with two black spots, usually. And then one that Aman took a picture of. He doesn't have the app, but he took a picture anyways and showed it to me. Uh, in the family Hesperia Day is Pyrgus Malve, which was only found one time two years ago. So really great to have another record of it actually in the same place as it was two years ago. So, um, yeah, so 20 different species of butterflies already. Hopefully we can build on that. Um, so thanks again for beta testing, for being excited about it, uh, and just for collecting the data. It's really great. Petroglyphs as yeah, well. Yeah, petroglyphs as well. We, I mean, just in one day we got, what, 50? Yep. In one day in Irisu. And then uh, the first day we, we went out, Matt got a wonderful picture of a uh, red deer. Um, lots of interesting symbols. And now all of these have a correlation between a photo and a GPS location, whereas before, sometimes we just had photos, sometimes we just had GPS locations. Now we have both on the ones that we've been collecting this year. And so when we, we go to make a case for maybe cultural heritage site for protection, uh, we can actually show where they are, what they are, and that gives more weight to them needing to be protected instead of us just saying, oh, well, we know there's a hundred up there. You know, well, where? What kinds? How old are they? Um, Is anybody studying in Bishkek? In Bishkek? I don't actually know if anybody's making a serious effort in Bishkek. Uh, Around Issaquul, there are a couple places that have petroglyphs as well, and those are the places that everybody goes to. So that's those are the tourist hotspots for petroglyphs. Um, you know, perhaps that could be one way to get tourism to come in here and help support the local community in this valley as well, if people find out about them. So, so great. All right, thanks again. And if you have suggestions for the app, please come talk to me. Uh, I've already heard a bunch. I've already actually written them to the guy in Bishkek that does our coding. Uh, but if you have any new ones, please let me know. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you.